Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. Lord, as we come to you during this midweek message, the message of the kingdom, we ask that your name be glorified and we grow more intimate with you, taking a step one day at a time to get to know you more intimately and that we may be able to, through your word and through your your living Holy Spirit, we just ask that you guide us, lead us and bring us into the ways, the truth and the life and also having an impact for your kingdom through the message of the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We spoke of um, Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 1 to 58 there. And, uh, that was the opening section of our message today. Appreciating that uh, there's a message to be heard and also a message to be received. There's a purpose of predictive prophecies which is a great kingdom dynamic that we can open, uh, open up on. And that's the promise and prophecy that are abundant in the Bible. God gives many assurances of his readiness to bless and often speaks of things he plans to do in the future. In both cases, there's always conditions. God's call to align with his will, so his word of promise can bless the obedient. In chapters uh, 28, it is a classic study of the, both of God's promises and his prophecies. Now, if we compare verses 1 and 2, verses uh, 58 and 59, we can see the blessings that are promised to the potential obedient believers and the judgment that are predicted certainly for the disobedient but this example and the purpose of the predictive prophecy in the bible is to teach to warn to instruct towards obedience and fruitful living it is never given to arouse curiosity or promote guesswork in matthew chapter 24 jesus makes several prophecies about things to come but tells his disciples that his purpose is only to elicit a practical response of obedient living not guessing at the possible schedule of forthcoming events but elsewhere our Lord indicates that the predictive prophecies are also given to undergird our confidence in God's sovereignty and also his omniscience that he is in control and that he does know the end from the beginning but note how the words of John chapter 13 verses 19 and John chapter 14 verses 20 and John chapter 16 verses 4 where his triple emphasis on the purpose of his prediction occurs that when it does come to pass you may believe that I am he that is God's Son, the Messiah, that is. As we go into this message of the kingdom, we appreciate that Jesus came to teach the, the ways, the truth, and the life through, through the Gospels as well as uh, through the, the apostles and those that uh, came after him. But what about those that went before him? In the previous teachings, we've learned that uh, you know, Joshua was the, the Jesus of the Old Testament, as many, many others were similar in trait and in nature and in character. Joshua chapter 1 verses 9 it says have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage do not be afraid nor dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go sometimes it's uh, those steps of courageousness uh, courageousness and also uh, knowing that we can be strong in in the Lord that will allow us to know that uh, we have an opportunity to take great strides as it was in Joshua when he was taking them into the promised land he gave them a hope and future that was later prophesied. Let's read a leader trait, kingdom dynamic. A leader's courage develops as the fruit of the spirit and encouragement. Moses reveals this leader role which shapes the young leader to be Joshua. He encourages him in leading God's people into the promised land. And he encourages him as he emphasizes the seriousness of the task. Then the Lord himself encourages Joshua after Moses is dead, enjoining him not to fear but to be strong and to be courageous. The officers of Israel's army also encouraged Joshua, promising their loyalty and urging him to take the leadership. Those who would shape leaders, encourage them. Those who would follow, do the same. It's quite important that because shaping leaders for the future is based on the biblical kingdom values. And this is a great kingdom dynamic that we can take, is that those who would shape leaders, encourage them. And those who would follow do the same. What a great kingdom dynamic. So often in this world we find people who want to kill, steal and destroy. By putting down, by killing, stealing and destroying. What does it say? I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to me except through the Father. 
the kingdom ways are higher than the earthly ways. And when we appreciate this, we can not only warn, instruct, correct, but also lead, guide, as per the Holy Spirit, being strong. Word well, Strong's Accordance 2388. Be strong, courageous, valiant, manly, strengthened, established, firm, fortified, obstinate, and mighty. Generally, the word strong or strengthened defines shazak, but there is a wide range of meaning for this word, which occurs no more than 300 times in the Old Testament. For example, to encourage as when David encouraged himself, literally made himself strong in the Lord. And Shazak is the root of several Hebrew names, including Hezekiah, meaning strengthened by Yahweh. You know, there's controversy through stories and parables, uh, the narratives and the discourses that we can have a look at. Uh, we're going to be turning to Matthew. Because we can learn a little bit about what it says in the Gospels. Because when it was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, as well as the prophet Joel, as well as the prophet Malachi, we can appreciate that there's great value in what was to come. In this case, it was John the Baptist who sends messengers to Jesus. And we're going to be just diving a, bit, a, bit, a little bit back and forward. But let's have a look at uh, what it says in Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 to 12. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you coming? Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk and the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Offense does bring a stumbling block. And just recently even, you know, checking my own heart. is Needing to exercise the faith of uh, letting go of things that were and holding on to what is to come from personal experience and revelation I can appreciate and um, share how offense can cause a delay as it was in the wilderness when the 10 had the negative and the 2 had the positive and uh, it was by that that the 40 year journey in the wilderness raised a new generation but that new generation also had to learn how to not be offended and word well, Strong's Accordance uh, 4624 is to put a snare or a stumbling block in the way. The noun to which it is related refers to the bait stick of a trap. In the New Testament, uh, shandalizo uh, is always used metaphorically of that which hinders right conduct or thought, hence to cause a stumble. It's a great leading leader's lesson there, even just for those that are coming into leadership. When we appreciate that there is a fence that uh, was laid even at uh, in the times of Jesus and after him, we can, we can appreciate that these things will happen in our lives. But Jesus presents the activities that were fulfilled in Isaiah chapter 35 verses 5 and 6. The future, future glory of Zion the eyes of the blind are open, the ears of the deaf are unstopped, and the lame shall leap like a deer, and tongues of the dumb sing. And waters shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. Let's go back to Isaiah there quickly. Because, um, we could all learn something from it. When we give thanks to God uh, for His everlasting provision we know that when he moves we move with him but as with those tribes and how devastating it was when they took on that negative report and instead of the two positive reports having that generation die off in the wilderness because they didn't believe we appreciate that maybe there is conflict in the kingdom but we take it by force and this is another kingdom dynamic that we can read Jesus asserts the violence of the kingdom the unique gr grammatical construction of the text does not make clear if the kingdom of God is the victim of the violence or if the kingdom advances in victory it does so through violence spiritual conflict and warfare but the context does 
And Jesus' reference to the non-religious style of John and the confrontive miraculous ministry of Elijah teaches the kingdom of God makes its penetration by a kind of violent entry opposing the human status quo. It transcends the softness of the state religious formalism um, and exceeds the pretension of the child's play. It refuses to dance to the music of society's expectation that the religious community provide either entertainment as we played the flute or dead tra uh, traditionalism we mourned. And Jesus defines the violence of his kingdom's expansion by defining the sword and the fire. And he's brought a different form from the battle techniques of uh, political and military warfare. But the upheaval caused the kingdom of God is not caused by political provocation or armed advance. It is the result of God's order shaking relationships, households, cities and nations by entry of the Holy Spirit's power working in and through people. All the prophets and the law prophesied unto John, until John. And if you are willing to receive it, here is Elijah who is to come. And he who has ears to hear, let him hear. But, what to, uh, but to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their companions, saying, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. And we mourned to you, and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, He has a demon. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a wine, a wine bibbler, a friend of the tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is justified by her children. Just understanding a little bit about this is that the, the proof of the uh, threshold of the Christian era is uh, found in the identification of the ministry of John. John the Baptist with Elijah's ministry. <laughs> we turn back to Malachi for that, which is a great opportunity to be able to appreciate the day of the, the, day of the Lord, the great and awesome day of the Lord. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great day and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. You know, this prophetic utterance closes the Old Testament with the hope of unity and healing. Malachi, like Abadai and the predecessors, look with their telescopic vision towards Christ's first advent and salvation for all who believe in him. But he also views Christ's second advent with the final judgment of the wicked and ultimate salvation of those who believe in him and fear his name. Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 to 3. In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. This comes into a message about the kingdom. It's about the repentance. And I have just had to just do that again and again and again. As we let go of the old and hold on to the new. And just uh, repent for the forgiveness. And the forgiveness that you need. And the forgiveness that you haven't received. And the forgiveness that you should give. But what about the belief? We spoke about a message on Sunday about Moses and, and uh, the dove and appreciating that it's a, it's a journey of faith, hope and love. Appreciating the, stumble, the stumbling blocks that come and uh, how we can remove them and continue being faithful to what he's called us to do, remembering Noah. Strong's Accordance 3340, repent from meta, after, neo, to think. Repentance is a decision that results in a change of mind which in turn leads to a change of purpose as well as action. Repentance is a kingdom dynamic and it's a message of the kingdom. The first call of the kingdom is to repentance. The implications of biblical repentance are threefold. Number one, renunciation and the reversal. Number two, the submission and teachability. And number three, the continual shapeability. But there's no birth in the kingdom without hearing the call of salvation announcing one's sin and turning from sin towards Christ the Saviour. There is no growth in the kingdom without obedience to Jesus' commandments and childlike responsiveness as a disciple of Jesus and yielding to the teachings of God's word. 
And there is no lifelong increase of fruit as the citizens of the kingdom without a willingness to accept the Holy Spirit's correction as well as the guidance. But there's a defining hope that will bring the terminology of the kingdom as we shared last week. The New Testament records 137 references to the kingdom and over 100 of these are during Jesus' ministry as his entire teaching and approach as Messiah, the Saviour King, centers on this theme. To what does the kingdom refer? It refers to God's sovereign rule in the universe and he is King of the heavens. But more specifically it refers to the entry of God's long anticipated anointed one. The prophesied Messiah, the promised son of David, who would not only be the saviour, but the deliverer and the king of Israel. And also to all of mankind. The Gentiles, which is all nations, as we said, he will bring them together. That's all flesh. That were promised recipients of the hope. And declaring that the kingdom is at hand, and that is drawing near, John was announcing that the rule of God's king was about to overthrow the power of the evil one. Both human and hellish. The kingdom was near because the king was here. And his presence introducing the power of the kingdom of God meant a new world of potential hope to mankind. Man would no longer need to be held hostage to either the rule of death over mankind, resultant from the sin of sinning, and the deadening rule of the oppressive human system, political or otherwise. And further, the kingdom of darkness would be confronted by death and deprivation, disease and destruction levied by those evil forces and satanic powers, powers which would begin to be overthrown. As God's King, Jesus offers blessings of God's rule, now available to bring life to every human experience, as well as deliverance from the dom dominion of either flesh or the devil. Now, the nearness of God's reign confronting people with an inescapable decision explains the urgency of John's message here, the message of repentance. Isaiah's prophecy likens John to a royal herod ordering the repair of the roads in preparation for the coming of the king. And the ark, the ark was made of acacia, an acacia tree, as well as the Ten Commandments and the, the manna, and the rod, represented the presence of God and was Israel's most sacred possession. Let's just go back to you, Joshua chapter 3, verses 4. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 200,000 cubits by measure. And do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. When we, did, when we haven't entered into something that uh, we are familiar with, it's something that uh, we may feel a little bit apprehensive about, maybe feeling a little bit um, fearful, anxious, uncertain, doubtful. As we'll learn just now, there's great kingdom dynamics that teaches us to know that we have an awesome God. Joshua chapter 3 verses 4 speaks of that word past, which is the strongest Gordon's 5, 6, 7, 4. To cross over, to go over, to go beyond, get over, go through, pass through, pass along, come over, pass beyond, or transgress. Abba translates in the, new, uh, in the King James Version by more than 40, uh, 60 English words and phrases occurs more than 500 times. And one of its meanings is to pass from one side to the other, pictured most easily by the crossing of a river, as the present text an impossible derivative of Ibri, which is the Hebrew uh, meaning of ethnic description of Abraham and by the extension of his descendants. In Genesis chapter 14 verses 13 and Exodus chapter 7 verses 16 and 1 Samuel chapter 29 verses 3 gives us an indication that Ibri has been regarded as the name for Eber's descendants and Eber was the great grandson of Noah's son Shem who was the father of the Semitic people and the direct ancestor of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 11 verses 10 to 26 the Hebrews would simply be one band or tribe of Semites. And Ibri may also refer to one who had crossed over the Euphrates from the east lands as Abraham did. That's the Euphrates River. Speaking of rivers, there's a lot of floods going on all over the world at the moment as well as fires. Now the last two Sunday messages on the 27th of August and the 3rd of September, we spoke of uh, Noah, the, the, the raven, as well as the dove. 
giving a great illustration of how important it is for us to know that we are continuing, as the message was this last week, with the faith. As you come back into the ark, as the dove did after that first attempt, after the raven that didn't accept the mission, gives us the opportunity to come back in his rest and just to allow him to be able to work in and through us and allowing that rest to happen. Noah means rest, or relief, should I say, as well as rest. Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 to 30, he says that at the time Jesus answered and said to them, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seems good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one who sent the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. There's a word wealth, easy, which is a strong accordance, 5543. From the verb, shramai is to use, and the word denotes that which is useful, pleasant, good, comfortable, suitable, serviceable. The legalistic religious system was a severe burden, but service to Jesus was not. Because it is uh, well-fitting and built on the personal relationship with God and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Who's the source of your revelation? In contrast to the Jewish burdensome and legal, legalism, uh, ways of doing things, Jesus calls for an open, free, and loyal relationship. That's the yoke. And this enables the obedience to the law's righteousness, which is the burden. Now when Isaiah the prophet spoke, saying these things, hmm, how it's been fulfilled. Matthew chapter 12, verses 18 through to 21. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, and I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and his name Gentiles will trust. So I was reading that I was just thinking about a loved one in a conversation about the openness and the receptiveness to the gospel and to the truth and uh, the way and the life. And Jesus left the 99 to go after the one that showed his compassion, his sincere love. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed and the blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. There's healing in his wings. Strong's Accordance 2323 Compare therapy, therapeutic, originally to serve in a menial way, such as a household domestic attending to the members of a family. Since their duties included the care of the sick family members, the word took on a medical connotation in the sense of taking care of or tending and uh, providing for the sick. From there it came to mean healing and restoring to health and to cure. So Lord, as we come to you today, we just ask that we, well, we repent of anything that uh, we've, we've said in word done indeed or even thought of and we just humble ourselves and ask that you do the healing that maybe we can't you bring them into the kingdom of God that maybe we can't touch them by divine revelation as you've done with so many people before men and women and children 
and allow us to walk in your newness of life so that others may do the same and likewise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now when a house is divided, it cannot stand. We look at it from an internal point of view, is that if we have this conflict of um, going against God, or not believing in God, or coming against God's children, we understand that that's the battle of the kingdom. That's that renewal process. It's letting go of the old thought patterns and belief systems and words spoken and um, lives lived. And bringing us into a newness, a fullness of, of life in Him. The experience, heavenly experience shared this time last year to the day. After such a negative report, it was turned out to be such a great blessing from our Lord God Almighty with our own mother and uh, one that we loved and as we approach the anniversary, it's just amazing to see the beauty that came from such a concerning situation. So when we don't know the answers or do or we, or we contending for the faith, we keep trusting. Because there's divine healing, whether it's this side of heaven or in heaven. You choose. Are you going to be the two that can stand in faith that the promised land is there for the taking or are you going to be like the ten go back to Egypt or travel in the wilderness or even die or perhaps maybe even stone the two it's a great lesson for us to learn even in the days that we're living in there's a kingdom here and this is the message of the kingdom to advance his kingdom bring people into relationship communication trust And how beautiful it is when you see just that one coming into the kingdom of God. You know, in this very dramatic encounter with the Pharisees over Jesus' um, reshaped definition of the kingdom of God shows them the absurdity of the charge of, of casting out demons by Satan's power. This transformation from darkness into the kingdom of God is something that the saints do, bringing people into relationship with Him. But the miracle was performed by the Spirit of God as an indication of the presence of the Kingdom of God. I relate in that back to our anniversary of this wonderful encounter that uh, was had by our mom. It was done by the Spirit of God, by the Kingdom of God. Yes, we stood in the gap. We prayed and we interceded. <laughs> one waters, well, one plants, the other one waters, but it's God who gives the increase. And as I say that, I'm going to just uh, sandwich this uh, beautiful message with uh, a desire of um, care. Pastoral care, but also um, care for the current and future generations. Because when we come to know our Lord God Almighty, El Shaddai, His Son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, we're going to make sure that we don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. But the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. Either in this age or the age to come. This is a very stark warning and um, saying of Jesus that he was really wanting them to come to grips of the power and the movement of the Holy Spirit. Let's just have a read through something here. The Pharisees slandered the Holy Spirit by acknowledge, acknowledgeably attributing His work to the devil, thus committing the unpardonable, unpardonable sin. Their sin was not an act of impulse or ignorance, but the result of continued and willful rejection of the truth concerning Jesus. It was a sign against spiritual knowledge, for they had ample evidence of the truth from the words and deeds of Jesus. But in deliberately choosing to insult the Holy Spirit, they forfeited His ministry in their lives and will not be forgiven. 
The analogy demonstrates that the blasphemy was not merely an utterance of the lips, but an expression of the character. So when you go against the promptings and the guidance and the leadings of the Holy Spirit, especially blaspheming it, saying, as the Pharisees did, attributing it to the devil, it will not be forgiven. The analogy de demonstrates that the blasphemy was not merely an utterance of the lips, but an expression of the character. This an analogy demonstrates that the blasphemy was not merely an utterance but of the lips, but an expression of character. A tree is known by its fruits, and sometimes uh, the earthly realm expects the fruits to be physical material. But what about the fruits of the Spirit? You know, the scribes and the Pharisees, they ask for a sign. Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with the generation and condemn it, because they re repent repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. But a little bit earlier about that tree of uh, the, the tree known by its fruits, uh, the spiritual tree. Justified. Strong's Accordance 1344, legal term signifying to acquit, declare righteous, to show to be righteous. In this passage, Jesus refers to the day of judgment as the day of his determining condemnation or justification based on our heart's response to the Spirit. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This is Jesus, um, his mother and his brothers who sent for him. But the will is quite strong. Strong's Accordance 2307, used objectively of that which is uh, willed, designed, or desired, and subjectively of the emotion of being desirous. The word is used both of the human will and the divine will. I want to just touch on something that... Uh, happened about a year and a half ago, two years ago. Uh, brothers and sisters who do the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. We have spiritual mothers, we have spiritual fathers, we have spiritual brothers and spiritual sisters. And you know, I'm using an example of our own gardener a year and a half ago. He had just born a child. And through this uh, new birth in the physical, it was recognized that um, this little child had um, a little uh, string, not only wrapped around its arm, but wrapped around its, its waist. Um, and when I found out a little bit more about it, it, uh, it, it presented itself as something that was believed or is believed by certain um, groups or individuals uh, that brings some sort of... Um, whether it be protection or something on the lines of um, ancestral stuff. And this poor little child had an illness that um, they didn't know what was going on. And it was uh, quite concerning. It was taken to hospital, removed, but it came back just as much, maybe even stronger. And I just, um, I just uh, asked if, if it was... Um, what was the reason for that string being put over or around the waist and, 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 and the arm? And they told us that it was uh, part of the Sangorma practice and um, that's uh, the spiritual ancestry belief system. And uh, I, I, I just uh, asked the Lord what to do, how to handle the situation. And uh, the response was to lovingly just guide them into 
maybe something that might be causing that um, illness and they they had it seen to uh, you know um, and I think the message here is that we've got to be careful what we believe in in terms of superstitions or things that we put around ourselves or um, things that may have a spiritual connotation that maybe we're not aware of especially for the, the beautiful little children of God that are coming into this world as well as his children both young and old so anyway not only that occasion but other occasions when we've gone to go pray in the hospitals we've seen the similar things and we've seen great healing of, of, of those that have uh, removed them and given their lives to the Lord and uh, have been healed great miraculous things so what I'm trying to say is that some things are, are unknowingly you know given to us and that may have a spiritual impact uh, whether for good or bad you know it's always advisable to have a look into the the the, the, the context of, of the meaning as to why people would um, you know what's the meaning behind uh, having a physical representation in this case of the gardener's son who was ill and had this great lump that kept on growing back and uh, since then we've prayed about it and you know it has been healed um, but my encouragement for all of us is just uh, be mindful of what we put into our on, on our bodies into our bodies into our minds and into our spirits another testimony was just speaking to someone about a deliverance that they're going through and we know that deliverance is a lifetime process but as the Holy Spirit uh, leads and guides and, and uh, gives us some sort of uh, fullness we want to keep connected to the vine because we don't want other spirits to be coming in and causing um, further concern hence the reason why when you are baptized in water and Holy Spirit we are washed and we are protected no weapon formed against you shall prosper anyway Matthew chapter 12 verses 40, uh, 43 to 45 when an unclean spirit goes out of a man he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds an empty swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first state. So shall it be with the wicked generation. We spoke of this last weekend, of the parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out to the house and sat by the sea. And the great multitude were gathered together to him, so he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them, and some fell in the stony places, where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up, because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, and withered away, and some fell on amongst thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on the good ground and yielded a crop, some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. There's a present and a future kingdom, and this may help us appreciate the value of the kingdom as we continue to be cleansed from the inside out and uh, be renewed and refreshed and it's not a once-off thing it's a continuous um, exercise day by day minute by minute hour by hour week by week month by month year by year this is the message of the kingdom it's another kingdom dynamic and Jesus introduces the parables as a means to teaching the kingdom truths of the 40 parables Jesus gave he made direct references to the kingdom in 19 these stories clearly relate to different time frames. Some impact the present teaching, the need for kingdom people to have hearing ears, the breadth of the kingdom of spread, and the cost of the kingdom's acquisition. Others relate to the future, the teaching, the final disposition of the fruit of the adversary's hindrance, and the final disposition of the mixed in gathering from the kingdom outreach. In mixing these two aspects of the kingdom, Jesus helps us appreciate the kingdoms as both present and perspective both now and then the message of the kingdom is two-edged and relates to two frames of time first God in Christ is now recovering man from his double loss relationship with God and of rulership under God and he promised that at man's fall illustrated in it the patriarchs and Israel's history and now the king has come to begin fully bringing it about 
The kingdom is being realized presently in partial and personal ways as it spreads through the earth by the Holy Spirit's power in the church. Second, the kingdom will be realized finally in consummate and conclusive ways only at the, turn of Je- at the return of Jesus Christ. We will experience his triumph now in part will then be fully manifested. This complete view of all the understandings and applying the principle of the kingdom come without falling into the confusion of expecting now what the Bible says will only happen then. This gives us a wonderful indication as to how the Holy Spirit works and sometimes it is now but sometimes it's not yet. The parable constitutes one of eight major parables of the kingdom of God and its central message is that the gospel of the kingdom will meet will be met with varying levels of success in the human heart. The Jews were awaiting the dynamic apocalyptic kingdom which could not be resisted and which entirely would destroy evil. They could not conceive of a servant type kingdom coming quietly to invade evil and solicit human responses responses from Jesus interpretation. We also learn that the kingdom is currently present though not consummated, that self-sufficiently oppose the gospel and the measurably great response can be expected from many, some hundredfold. About one third of Jesus' teachings was in parables, brief stories of everyday life told by way of analogy to illustrate the spiritual truths. Whereas in interpreting parables, one must guard against the fanciful uh, details, staying primarily with the major point of the story which is Jesus' own interpretation. It demonstrates that the details of the parable can indeed hold symbolic significance and application. Determining significance can be at times difficult and maybe abused. Yet we should not go or rule out any such uh, leadings of the same indwelling spirit that first inspired the teachings. And the general approach would be to find the primary point using grammatical historical principles and staying consistent with the original purpose and message of the parable. Then move on to the second point of application. Using the whole scriptures as revelation. That's to guide the interpretation of scriptures. Ears to hear denotes the spiritual um, need and uh, the essential need for teachability. The hearing heart is to be present uh, if the seed or the kingdom tree is to be received and to become fruitful. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Word wealth desired is Strong's Accordance 1937 to set one's heart upon eagerly eagerly longing for a great desire to lust after. The word emphasizes the intensity of the desire rather than the object desired. It describes both good and evil desires. You know that the disciples were privileged to see and hear the things not given to God's servants in the Old Testament. And the parable of the sower is is yet to be discussed. We'll discuss it in a later message. I just want to go back to Joshua. So going between these uh, new accounts, uh, New Testament accounts and Old Testament accounts, just so that we can appreciate the value of maybe where we've come from. Or maybe where we're standing and where we're going to go into. Now Joshua commanded the people saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day that I say to you, shout. Then you shall shout. This private encounter with heaven preceded Joshua's ministry and the prophetic role at Jericho. He realized that there's a commander much, much more mightier than he, who stands ready to lead the nation into conquest. So how do we silence that unbelief? Before, during, or after? Maybe a diagnosis. 
maybe going into your eternal inheritance, maybe stepping into whatever God has called you to. Many texts in God's words instruct us to wait on God, to stand still, to be silent before Him. In this text, Joshua commands the children of Israel to maintain a total silence as they walk around the city of Jericho. The memory that Israel's 40-year punishment in the wilderness was a result of the people's memory in unbelief was doubtful and doubtless, sorry, doubtless in Joshua's mind. At the time, the spies had returned with a report motivated by what man sees without the Holy Spirit-given vision. The unbelief that they could take the land, that they could not take the land, sealed their fate in the wilderness. Now, with the lessons of history in mind, Joshua's directive to keep silent is a precaution that teaches us when facing great challenges, do not permit your lips to speak unbelieving words and prohibit demoralizing speech from your lips. Words can bind up or set free. Hence, the order to silence, and later they would see the salvation of the Lord pursuant upon their shout of triumph. Now, we cannot help what we see or hear, but our refusal to speak doubt and fear will keep our hearts more inclined to wait on what God can do rather than what we cannot or what we may hear or see. So you had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once, and then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua arose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Then seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram horns, and before the ark of the Lord went up continually and blew with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them. But the rear guard came after the Lord of the God, the ark of the Lord, sorry, with the priests continually blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early and about the dawning of the day marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only they marched around the city seven times. So how can we silence our unbelief in the diagnosis or the stepping into the eternal inheritance, the promised land? Appreciating the value and the lessons of the Lord God Almighty, the commander of the army of the Lord gives us that great hope and great future. Just worshipping the other day, I was just uh, touched by the Holy Spirit and just uh, as a result, again, last happened in April when there was a worship event led by the Holy Spirit to take off the shoes because where we stand sometimes in worship is holy and we need to appreciate that. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked and behold a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand and Joshua went to him and said to him are you for us or are you for our adversaries? So he said, No, but I am, as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. So Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. So Joshua did so. <laughs> it's amazing how the Holy Spirit speaks to us, and then we come back and we find it in Scripture. Similar example of the testimony of um, what I shared on Sunday about um, angels and how the ministering angels can bring healing but it needs to be the Holy Spirit that's bringing the healing so that it can be based on the foundations of the, the truth, the way and the life. You now God's covenantal strategy in this, um, in this context had no apparent results but it also was a test of their obedience and their trust. But it does another thing. It uh, demonstrates the worship and the power of worship as seen in the leading of the ark and the continual trumpet blowing. But that number seven symbolizes perfection and mighty word of God mentioned at creation when you were formed and the first fruits of the harvest were to be set apart for God. What are our first fruits? Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching in the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. 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 
and believe the gospel. This is um, the gospel of the kingdom. It's the message of the kingdom. The synoptic gospels and Acts make at least 20 direct references to the preaching of the gospel of kingdom from John the Baptist throughout Jesus' ministry and the disciples' ministry during Jesus' ministry and throughout Acts as well. And Jesus prophesied the same message shall be taken to the ends of the world, commissioning his disciples to do this and promising his Holy Spirit's power for the task. It is clear that the early church proclaimed the same message that Jesus uh, preached, that is, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And also they experienced the same confirming evidence that were present in his ministry. There is only one gospel. Jesus preached it, transmis transmitted it to his disciples, and has committed it to his church. But Paul warned against ever receiving any other gospel. Any other may either be a message of outright error or an argument for a diluted message, devoid of power through nominal Christian. Jude, th Jude uh, 3 urges us to always contend for the original, the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So to hold to the full gospel of the kingdom, and well, we'll do well to expect the Lord to confirm the word that was the sign of his promise. About that Holy Spirit. How important it is for us to be obedient and guiding and leading through the Holy Spirit, guidance through the, the baptism of water and Holy Spirit. It can't be understood by those who haven't yet come into that position and relationship. But the Holy Spirit is the ministry of the kingdom. And I just shared with the loving brother in Christ and uh, shared how the prompting, the leading, the guiding of the Holy Spirit is vital for us to be able to stay in step with him. And Jesus' ministry did not begin until he received his anointing as Messiah, the empowering that came through the des descent of the Holy Spirit upon him. And though conceived and bore by the Spirit's power and the sinless, his whole lifetime he did not attempt ministry without the Spirit's power. He insisted John baptized him. Not for repentance, but because he knew the Holy Spirit would come upon him at that time. That's that dove that I made reference to in our message on Sunday. The dove that Noah sent versus the dove that was put on Jesus' shoulder. And from that time, he was led by the Spirit. Moved into his ministry, declaring the presence of God's kingdom and manifesting its miracles, signs and wonders. But the pathway points each believer to the need for power. And if his kingdom ministry is being to be advanced through us, his church, his church, his body, his church. Like him, we too are born of the Spirit. And though obviously our spiritual birth is not as his biological virgin birth, the point remains. The spiritual rebirth saves, but spiritual endowment is needed for ministering in the kingdom power. And similarly, our justification in Christ being declared sinless does not qualify for kingdom power in ministry. In his carnation person, Jesus and his perfection exceeded ours in every single way. Yet Jesus still acknowledged the need for his own receiving of power from the Holy Spirit to pursue his ministry. So what more needs to be said? Let each of us personally hear his command. Receive the Holy Spirit. So Lord, we just ask that whoever hears this message will receive the Holy Spirit. Never blaspheming the Holy Spirit, but walking in your ways, your truth and your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go back to Joshua. Joshua chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. So it was, when they brought out those kings to Joshua, and that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said to the captains of the men of war who went with him, Come near. Put your feet on the necks of those kings. And they drew near and put their feet on their necks. Then Joshua said to him, Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. This gives us the strength and the courage to face our enemy. It's part of our deliverance. And um, as I mentioned before, that could be a diagnosis, it could be a calling into what God has, has uh, led you to. The average believer tends to doubt or fear the pr prospect of receiving dominion over the dark powers of the enemy. 
the lesson here in Joshua is admonishing his captains to place their feet on the necks of their evil kings that they had conquered demonstrates our privilege through Christ's complete victory over the devil. As members of his body, we are seated with him. All evil powers underfoot. We can overcome the strong man, for Jesus is our commander, who has vanquished the enemy and promises continuous victory. And Christ has triumphed over those, all the power of the enemy, and given the followers of authority over dark powers. Commission all who believe to enter into this spiritual battle. Strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. So with these beautiful teachings, not only through Joshua but through the Gospels, we can take great value in how we can continue walking in His way, His truth, His life. Luke chapter 17, let's just go there quickly, verses 20 and 21, speaks of the coming of the kingdom. Now when he asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered and said to them, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. He's starting to appreciate that how he's restoring us body, mind and spirit because he's putting his Holy Spirit back into us. Fundamental to the New Testament truth is that the kingdom of God is the spiritual reality and the dynamic available to each person who received Jesus Christ as the Savior and King. Lord of Lords. To receive him, the King, is to receive his kingly rule and not only in our lives individually but over our affairs as well but also through our lives and by our service and our love for him and each other. The kingdom of God is within us, Jesus said. This is never to be construed as possible if we operate independently of God's power and grace. The possibility of uh, the reinstatement to rulership is brought about only through the forgiveness of sins and full redemption in Christ through the cross. The Bible never suggests either that there, there exists in man a divine spark which may be fanned to flame by noble human efforts, or that godliness or godlikeness is somehow resident in man's potential. Though human beings are or may become gods, to the contrary, man is lost in darkness and alienated from God. However, full salvation brings restored relationship to God and full potential for his kingdom's rule that is within us. And as we walk with him, Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit to cause the anointing of his messiahship to be transmitted to us so it is on these terms only that the human being can say the kingdom of god is within me and he said to his disciples the day will come when you will desire to see one of these days the son of man and you will not see it and they will say to you look here or look there and do not go after them or follow them for as lightning flashes out of one part of heaven and shines on the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation, and as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, drank, married, wives, and given into marriage until the day of Noah into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, it will also... Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on that day Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, destroyed them all. So even will it be in the days of when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Now remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in the night there will be two men, one in, in one bed. One will be taken, and the other left behind. And two women will be grinding together. One will be taken, and the other left. The two men will be in the field, and one will be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to him, Wherever the body is, the eagles will be gathered there together.
snatched heavenwards. Snatched heavenwards as the bird snatches its prey. Speaking of the rapture of the church. And who is his church? Who is his body? Now that Joshua begins his conquest of the land by charging the two and a half tribes to participate. But now he ends his duties by dismissing the 40,000 soldiers and giving them blessings to return to their families who waited 7 or 14 years. I just want to go into something here. Hold on a sec. Um, let's go. Possession. Strong's Accordance 272. Something obtained, seized or held. It usually refers to the land of Israel or portion of it which is to be held forever by Jacob's descendants in Psalms chapter 2 verses 8 God promises his Messiah the remotest parts of the earth that is the whole earth for his possession the related verb is from Ahaz meaning to seize, acquire, lay hold of to get, obtain, catch, take possession or to grasp this word is frequently translated to take hold of That altar by the Jordan was built with um, sacrificial worship, remaining covenantal and central to the tabernacle. Otherwise, elsewhere, it may have brought about the dangerously uh, worshipped pagan practices. You've just seen what's happened, that burning man. My prayer is that they will all come into full repentance and restoration through Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord. What treachery is there that you have committed against the God of Israel to turn away the, this day from following your Lord and in the day you have built for yourselves an altar that you might rebel against the Lord? A congregation is a crowd, assembly, a swarm, a family, a multitude, a com company. And Adai is from the verb yad to appoint, thus implying a group assembled together by appointment or acting together the word occurs more than 140 times in the Old Testament, most, of, most often references to the congregation, the congregation of Israel. You know, that incident in the wilderness wandering when the Israelites were enticed to build an altar and worship the deity of Pio, the Canaanite God. And as a result, God's wrath, 24,000 Israelites died on a, a, in an epidemic the sin of idol worship was still prevalent amongst the people and still prevalent today. Then Joshua gathered the tribes of the elders at Sheshem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord your God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river, in old times, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river and led him through all, throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I gave mountains of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Also I sent Moses and Aaron and I plagued Egypt according to what I did amongst them. And afterwards I brought you out. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots of, and horsemen to the Red Sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea upon them, and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, and dwelt there on the other side of the Jordan. And they fought with you. But I gave them into your hand, and that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them be from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, the, uh, the king of Zoab, arose to make war against Israel, and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But even Balaam said, How can I curse something that God has blessed? But I would not listen to Balaam, therefore I continued to bless you, so I delivered you out of his hand. Then you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you. 
and also the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girishites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. But I delivered them into your hand. I sent the hornet before you, which I drove them out before you, and the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you did not build. And you dwell in them, and you eat of the vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now therefore fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now Joshua spoke to them prophetically, that is, God was speaking to them through and through them. But the reverence and the respect towards one who loves but is also just was spoken of. We've got to give our allegiance to God. Reverence and respect towards one who loves but also is just. Joshua didn't call the people to choose for themselves because he believed there were two options from God's perspective. Doing so offered him the opportunity to affirm his own loyalty to God and to urge a similar response from the people. John chapter 3 verses 1 to 5 speaks of the new birth. This gives us an opportunity once we've crossed over. It's like that triple baptism. Red Sea, Jordan crossing. And as Jesus was baptized with the dove that landed on his shoulder. Remembering the the, the dove that, that came back into the ark in Noah. Let him come back into your life. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher that came from God and no one can do these things and the signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and to be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water, and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. There's an invite for a new birth. This is the message of the kingdom. Upon repentance, a new order of life opens to the believer in Jesus Christ. And Jesus used the figure of the new birth to dramatically indicate three things. Without new birth, there is no life and no relationship with God. In new birth, a new perspective comes as we see the kingdom of God. And God's word becomes clear and the Holy Spirit's works and wonders are believed and experienced as well as faith being alive. And through the new birth we are introduced literally to enter into a new realm where God's new kingdom can be realized. The new birth is more simply being saved. It's a requalifying experience, opening up the possibilities of our whole beings to the supernatural dimensions of life and fitting us for a beginning in God's kingdom order. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. And do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know, and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven but he who comes down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so even must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he who believes in him is not condemned, 
But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light because of their deeds that were evil. For every practice, everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does come to the truth, he comes to the light and she comes to the light that their deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Word wealth loved, agape, unconditional love, love by choice and love by the act of the will. A word denotes unconquerable benevolence and undefeatable goodwill. An agape will never seek anything but the highest good for fellow mankind. An agape, which is the verb, and agape the noun, are the words for God's unconditional love, and it uh, does not need a chemistry, an affinity, or even a feeling. An agape is a word that exclusively belongs to the Christian community. It is a love virtually known outside the New Testament. And when things are done in God, we can appreciate that that's the energy. The energy to toil, to be working, accomplish something, carry a trade, produce something, engage in toil, perform to do business. Must be about my father's business. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we just ask that this message penetrate the hearts, the minds, and the spirits of those who hear this message. And also by your Holy Spirit, Roch Word, even those who don't hear this message, we just pray and intercede and know and trust that you will do what we can't do. Help us to speak life into the circumstances of our loved ones and our situations and maybe even our health. Because this is the message of the kingdom. This is the message of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you Sunday. Next message on Knowing the Dove and Hope.